Yep. Yep. Let's go. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing, brother? Are you okay? Everything good? Good, alhamdulillah. Everything is perfect. Yeah. Um, if you briefly introduce yourself, your background, where your expertise are, so people watching on my channel can, uh, you know, have an idea who you are and uh, your experience. So, inshallah, if you would like to proceed. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, a few things about myself uh, may be appropriate for the moment. Um, I was a student of Dr. Sir Ahmed for, I guess, give and take uh, 30 years. Uh, I studied at Al Azhar. Uh, I was also a student of uh, Sheikh Imran Hussein for about two years when he was in New York. I benefited from him and uh, integrated his way of thinking into my way of thinking. And uh, so I've had uh, quite a few Islamic teachers. Um, the last of them is probably Dr. Irfan Khan, who is uh, from Dar Nadwa. And, uh, you know, he was, he spent his life studying Quran, so I benefited from that. Um, that is as far as the religious side is concerned. Then on the secular side, I've done quite a few things, but basically I'm a psychologist, um, is, is the short way to put it. Well, one thing I've, I've seen where is a big problem on YouTube is, because as Muslims, we know we, uh, we can't discriminate against a person, you know, if they are certain color, certain race, even religions, we can't discriminate against these people and if you look at certain beautiful words of the prophet peace be upon him and and how the prophet peace be upon him will um take the side of a non-muslim on the day of judgment for for the non-muslim against a muslim that wronged him in this life and um you know certain things like these are not uh showcased enough mm, absolutely and, uh, and, and the problem the Sira, there's a big deficit of showing and i think even for the muslim world to really realize the seerah of the prophet in terms of his character uh i think that we ourselves uh paint the prophet in a picture of our own stereotypes many times and uh so we we, we are we we ourselves lack to see that rahmatul side of him many instances yes of course us as muslims we're not meant to discriminate but the problem which we are seeing because at the moment we are seeing we've seen for the past uh, 100 years or plus uh, uh, emergence of uh, a zionist movement and uh, sheikh abdul hakim said that it was due to Christian anti-Semitism that this movement arose. The reason why there is this, the reason why there is Zionism, is not because of anything that happened in the Islamic world. The movement didn't arise in the Jews in the Muslim world. They tagged along much, much later. Some of them, to this day, some of them still have not done so. It arose in the heart of the West for a reason that we have to acknowledge as a good reason. 20 centuries of ferocious, unmeaning, anti-Semitic persecution. What Dan Cohn Sherbock calls the oldest hatred. Almost from the word go, the parent religion is vilified and punished and crucified. It's only 40 years ago when the Vatican took those things out of the mass that blamed the Jewish people collectively for the death of God. Only 40 years ago, and some of them still kind of think that way. Christendom finally, after the Holocaust, recognized that it had messed up really badly. How could the Prince of Peace have initiated such catastrophes for his own people? There's a lethal danger. Just as the idea of chosenness for the Jewish people was really challenged following the Holocaust. Chosen for what? They asked. 
So also the idea of Christianity as the ethical summation of the world seemed to come collapsing down when you look at the historic Christian record of treating the parent religion. A big crisis. And the solution was not Christendom making amends. And this is where they went wrong. Not Christendom making amends, but somehow the crime is so absolute. An original sin, centuries of stupid racism, anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish prejudice, the Inquisition and the pogroms and all of that black history, a long night. The solution was not for Europe to make amends, to give up part of Europe, not a Tauber, but instead the very strange idea that's present in St. Paul of the vicarious atonement. So great is the crime that you yourself can't atone for it. Find an innocent victim. And who are the innocent victims? The Palestinians. The people always allowed the Jewish people to go back to Jerusalem when the Crusaders and the Byzantines and others had persecuted them. The nearest people you've ever had to friends make them into the sacrificial victim. The Palestinians are the paschal lamb slaughtered on the rock of Jerusalem to atone for 20 centuries of Christian anti-Semitism. That's the poetry of the situation and it's very deeply rooted in a certain type of Western mentality. Let the Palestinians suffer because we really can't suffer in order to atone for this. Somebody else will make way for them, for the remnants of our horrible treatment towards them. And for a lot of Christian people online who are making content, you know, supposedly exposing Zionism, they've, they're coming from a, a place of a lot of hate. And I'm seeing a lot of people, what, what, they're, what they're doing is they're trying to capitalize on the same way how they capitalized uh, the Zionist uh, entities, capitalized on, on the, the far right, having hatred towards Islam. Uh, certain people on YouTube are using the far right movement, the white nationalists, as, okay, maybe Muslims are bad, but you need to hate the Jews now. And as, as Muslims, we have to come from another perspective uh knowing that we can't generalize this zionist movement uh it obviously it has caused and is a cause of a lot of the problems in the world today and uh as muslims we have to be almost like adding water to this fire here because uh it, it can become uh problematic when it's uh when someone blames all jews for example and when they're dissecting people who are not religious scholars at all, sitting on YouTube and they're dissecting passages from the Torah, passages from the Talmud, cherry picked. Same thing they do with the Hadith. You know, they, they do the same yep. thing with the Hadith and even some ayah of the Quran. But, but the problem is, like, the, these guys are not experts. And when they cherry pick certain verses and certain quotes from Jewish sources and Islamic sources, it, it, it can paint all Jews as bad and all Muslims as bad. So yeah. the problem is like some Muslim channels have uh, awoken to this issue, but it's been very hard for Muslims not to say, oh, Jews are the problem. Jews are the problem. This has caused almost a... Uh, a backlash of oh, Muslims just hate Jews, they're completely anti-Semitic. So I think it's very uh, important for Muslims maybe to show, for example, uh, the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who were Jews themselves. And also we believe in the Jewish prophets and we don't say they, they were sinful prophets, same way the Christians do. Right. Which they say Suleiman Laysam, you know, because of one of his wives going to idol worship, you become a magician. We don't believe this. We don't say such blasphemy. We don't say such blasphemy against Dawood alayhi salam, uh, Prophet David, peace be upon him, which they do. But we, we, we don't say these things. So I, th I think uh, the Muslim community on YouTube or in general have to expose evil where it is, wherever it is, and not be scared to say this is an Israeli problem or there might be a problem in the Jewish community or a Muslim community. The problems with uh, Saudi, the issues with Saudi, no one would talk about this issue. The issues, uh, for example, the bombing of Yemen. 
Mm, uh, yeah. the war in Yemen and and a lot of the things they were doing how they were mingling with uh, America and backdoor deals with Israel but the, the problem was if you were to speak about it and being a Muslim they would just call you Khwarij um, yeah reflecting upon what you said um, I think you can tell a lot about a religion in terms of its attitude towards the other through its eschatology, because eschatology is like, what's the final end, right? And what is the final end of the other? So when you look at uh, eschatology of our Christian brothers, for the most part, and when you look at the eschatology of our Jewish brothers, for the most part, you find that uh, it is very intolerant of the other, anyone besides them, right? So, like, for example, in Christianity, the idea is that we will build the third temple, Jesus will come back, and he will kill X number of Jews, and then he will be the king of the world, and it will be all Christianity. Now, there is different versions of this. Uh, you know, some people believe in the rapture, which is all the good people will go up, and then Jesus will come down for the judgment. So, it's seeing, meaning Jesus will come down in, in judgment to others. Um, so that is not necessarily a very uh, favorable view when it comes to the world. Uh, the same thing in the Jewish eschatology, you find that, uh, you know, it is basically one group that is ruling the world. We are waiting for the Messiah so that, you know, when he comes, then we will be with him and then he will rule the world. In Islamic eschatology, and I'm saying this from the perspective of how do how do okay how do we see the end, and how do we see the others in that end? So in our end, for example, uh, a few things are there. There's an ayah in the Quran: "Imin ahlil kitab illa yu'minuna bih." There, there is no none of the people of the book except they will believe. "Qabla yom al qiyamah," before the end of the day of judgment, they'll believe. According to Islamic eschatology. We believe majority of the Christians will become m Muslim because when Jesus comes back, he'll say, I am Jesus. And he will prove that he's Jesus. And he'll say, this is my Injil, this is my book. And this is what, and so Islam has a very positive view of Jesus coming back and how others will be treated. Uh, in the same way, uh, yes, uh, anyone who follows the Jal, whether he be Muslim, Christian, Jew, that's going to be uh, the the side that is going to um, uh, have the meaning. It, it, Jesus will be against the Antichrist, obviously. But it's not just it's not particular to the other. Meaning there will be many Muslims following the Jal too. So uh, our view of the Antichrist is not a particular ethnic or national or religious group. It includes people from our own group. It includes people from our own selves that will be on the other side and also from the other side. Then you have, uh, like the Quran says, Immin ahlil kitab. There's, there will not be ex uh, amongst the people of the book except they will believe in him, meaning Jesus. So also the, when the, the jal comes and at first he will trick the people, but when finally Isa alayhi salatu wa salam, he... Uh, destroys the Jal, then also at that time, many of the Jewish people will realize, wait, we were tricked. This is the real Christ. This is the real Messiah. And many of them uh, will also become Muslim. And uh, then this will uh, pave the way for Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, because now that the Christians would be the majority of the world at that time, you know, and that's a further discussion that I can have at some other point. But also then the Jewish uh, brothers, a lot of them will be, have become, when Jesus comes, a lot of things, uh, a lot of these people of Ahlul Kitab will become uh, Muslim or accept the truth. Or in other words, uh, they, will, they will see Jesus for who he is. Because everyone agrees, Christians, Muslims, and Jews, at least these three, we all agree that Jesus is coming back. So the is issue is which that which of those people that comes back is Jesus, and if he proves himself, yes, I'm Jesus, then it's only natural that they'll accept his claim. The 
ultimate view of the other, how we treat the other, how we see the other, can be seen through our eschatologies, Hindu, Hindu eschatology, Buddhist eschatology. And you will always find that in all of these eschatologies, the other, meaning those that are not part of the, the quote-unquote truth or of that religion, they wipe out the entire other or they get rid of the entire other. Whereas Islam is the only religion that does not have that eschatology. You know, there were predictions made by the Prophet, peace be upon him, of sunnah. people who would leave the Sunnah. While uh, scholars say there's a difference between Sunnah and Hadith, and there are some, of course, some problematic Hadith. But um, what about people who, they, because obviously there are some people who completely deny Hadith, which uh, I think is absurd. How, how would you respond to someone who there are some people online, there are some people who are teaching people not to believe in the second coming of Jesus, peace be upon him. How, how would we approach or counter such narratives? Well, first of all, I think it's clear in the Quran, but that would be a longer discussion. But uh, as far as denying hadith, if that is the issue, then I will say that the general argument that is given is quite logical. You see, Imam Bukhari didn't come into the scene except 300 years after the Prophet. So you have people collecting hadiths from before Imam Bukhari, but the main collections and the proper, what we can say, formal collections were done 300 years after the Prophet. So now the question is, how can I trust something 300 years after the Prophet? And it's a valid question. And the answer to that is very, very simple. I mean, you can be the judge, right? And I'll let you be the judge. So the, as far as the argument of the distance and how can I really trust this chain, a few things need to be clear. Number one, the collection of hadiths is not, was not a divine initiative as such. As such, it was not. But it was a human initiative. Now, how can you trust a hadith of the Prophet wasallam being recorded 300 years and then, of course, you also have the problem of the original manuscripts missing. Uh, you have the problem of many different versions of these, uh, say, hadiths, different versions of Sahih Bukhari, different versions of uh, Tirmazi, Abu Dawud, all of these. The only original manuscript that we have is of Abu Dawud. So now I've said this all so that the viewer can or the listener can understand that I, I sympathize and I understand where you're coming from. And I hope that now you will understand where I'm coming from. Let's say it's been 300 years after the Prophet. Rather, let's say it's been 500 years after the Prophet. Okay? But in a time where there's no communication, in a time where there's no fax lines, there's no phones, there's no, there's no way for people to talk to one another. Now, someone in Mecca says, the Prophet said A, B, C. And someone in Kufa is saying the Prophet said A, B, C, the exact same words. And someone sitting in Damascus, in, 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 in Damascus is also saying the Prophet said A, B, C. Now, my question is, if three people from three different cities who have never met each other are all saying the Prophet said these exact words and they've never met each other, then what do you make of that? You have to now... See, what you asked is a valid question, but you still have to answer the question that, okay, so yes, there, were, there was these people or this particular person in Mecca saying these words, and someone is saying the exact same words in Kufa, and someone else is saying these exact same words in Damashq. How, how do you reconcile that? Except that the source of those words have to be somewhat the same. Right. So the timing is an issue, but it is not really that much of an issue when you put it in the context of its actual history, which is formal Islam, formal Islam came into existence prior to the collection of hadith. Meaning, this is very important to understand this. Let's say, because I already mentioned what? Hadith collection is a human effort. Okay, 
So let's suppose for a second there was no no this this work of hadith collection which started with basically the concerns of Imam Shafi'i. Okay, that's why most most of the muhaddisin they're all what they follow Imam Shafi'i. Bukhari was Imam was Shafi'i for the most part of his life. Same with Muslim Tirmizi, Abu Dawud, Ibn Majah, and Nisai. They were all Shafi'i. They followed the Shafi'i Mazhab because the pioneer of the collection of hadith was Imam Shafi'i. And it's very interesting to know why he was the pioneer of this. Now, prior to the 300 years, what was going on? Islam was already intact and in practice in Mecca, correct? And in Medina and in Kufa. These three cities in particular, and Basra, sorry, four cities. So two twin cities, Mecca and Medina, Kufa and Basra. These are like the four most important cities of early Islam. Why these four were the most important? Because Islamic history, the distinction between Islamic history and Muslim history is this. Islamic history starts from the Nabuwa of the Prophet Wasallam till the era of the end of the era of the companions. This is Islam. Meaning from the Prophet till Radiallahu Anhu. That is, is that is Islamic history. After that, could be partially Islamic or not Islamic, but that's Muslim history for the most part. Now, in this Islamic history, they didn't do collection of hadith as such, but they were putting into practice Islam, meaning the janaza was there, the salah was there, the adhan was there, the buying and selling was there. That was there before the collection of hadith, yes or no? Yes, right? So all these Islam was being formally practiced for in 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 Medina. These are the children of who? The children of the Sahaba, the children of the companions of the Prophet and the companions of the Prophet. 3,000 companions of the Prophet lived in Kufa when Ali radiallahu an changed his Darul Khilafah to Kufa. 3,000 companions of the Prophet moved from Medina to Kufa. That's a large amount. So you have Islam completely in practice in Medina, in Mecca, in Kufa, in Basra. Prior to its kind of like preservation. So now here's the thing. If there was no hadith literature, let's say there was no hadith literature, but Islam as it is practiced in the fiqh of Medina, which is the Maliki Mazhab, or Islam as it is practiced in the Hanafi, what we call today Hanafi Mazhab, which is the people of Kufa for the most part, okay? And also parts of Basra. These things would have been preserved. The Islamic law came into existence prior to collection of hadith literature. So if there was no hadith literature, we would have had what the mazahibs teach anyway, anyhow. That would have been there and it would have been preserved and it would have been, it would have been already codified. The, dis the problem the people were having, now this is very important to understand this. Imam Malik is in Medina and, and he is acting in accordance to this very important point to remember. Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, both of them, never disagreed with what the children of the Sahaba of that city were doing. If you look at the fatawas of Ibrahim Nakhlai, who was the teacher of Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa does not disagree with it because he's doing exactly what those children of the Sahaba were doing in Kufa. And Imam Malik, in his mazhab, he actually has a terminology for this. He calls it A'malul Medina. He says that if there's a say hadith, if there's a say hadith, and the children of the Sahaba, the majority of them are doing something else. He will go with the ijma. He will go with the majority of the, rather than to take his interpretation of a certain specific hadith. My point here is, Islam was completely and fully established in these two twin cities and being practiced. Even if we didn't have hadith literature, we would have had the foundations and the 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 regulations and the codifications and the legal verdicts and the fiqh of these twin cities that would have been there and so islam would have not never been very much different even with the addition of the hadith the, the hadith literature does add something to it but for the most part it would have been almost 90 percent or more than 90 percent the same so i hope uh, what i'm trying to establish here are two things number one the distance may be a problem but that is solved when you understand that Islam was already in practice from before. Right? So, and number two, uh, oh, a uh, very important point. Because there were some differences between Kufa 
and Medina in particular. You know, our the most important, the most uh, not important, the most famous qira that we have of Quran, Hafs bin Asim, right? From where? Kufa. It's it's from the narrations of Kufa, Ali, from the place of Ali radiallahu. So, um, so the point I'm trying to make is these were important cities, Medina and Kufa in particular. And so Imam Shafi comes along and he studies with Imam Malik. And then he goes and studies with uh, the Hanafi Mazhab, with the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. And he says, wait, these were, you know, the children of the Sahaba in Medina were doing this. And the children of, of the Sahaba in Kufa are doing this. And he is trying to resolve the issues or the differences between Medina and Kufa. And he says to himself, how can I resolve these issues? So his methodology of resolving this issue was, okay, fine. Let's collect hadith. And let's gather the hadith and where whatever differences these two have between Medina and Kufa, whatever differences exist between them, we will bridge the gap by the hadith of collection of hadith. And that became his methodology. And then that's how the hadith collection formally started, even though informally it was already there. Mm -hmm. Like Imam Malik had his motta from the very beginning. But formally, as a as a hadith literature to solve fiqhi issues, even though Sahih Bukhari is not written from a fiqhi perspective, because Imam Bukhari actually passed away before he finished the book of Sahih Bukhari, but uh, but except definitely Tirmazi Abu Daud, these were written from a fiqhi perspective. You know, to be honest, if you, you know, watch the news every day, Doctors, psychologists recommend you don't watch the news because it's going to make you depressed. Don't watch it. So we have a group of people who just don't want to know. Just don't want to know. They want to, you know, watch their whatever programs they watch, Kardashians, well, I'm not sure what new programs they're making now. And, you know, they just want to watch this. They want to listen to this silly music. The, the music they have today is just disgusting. They want to listen to this and they want to forget about problems. Um, over the uh, the recent years, we've seen more as a promotion of cannabis, promoting it as almost, uh, <coughs> can we say, almost a miracle, miracle cure. Take this cannabis, it's going to solve your problems. So many movies about cannabis, uh, legalizing cannabis, obviously for medicinal uses. But, uh, you know, it's... it's is is promoted almost to teens. Really, is it's not even almost. It's promoted to teens. They, and one one thing which I've I've really hated, especially on YouTube. YouTube have cracked down on this, but th there's a lot of people who promoted cannabis use. A lot of YouTubers uh, talking about cannabis, uh, talking about weed, just to just to sound cool and edgy. But they know that their fan base are young kids. And why would they promote, you know, cannabis use, even if they do use it, but promoting it to young, the young generation. But the problem I've, I've, I've been seeing is uh, we, we, we got these camps of people that just don't care, just don't want to know. Um, and some people who are almost their paranoia consumes them. And they just want to talk about uh maybe everyone is involved in a secret society everyone is out for doing this against us is us we this person's against us the mailman's against us this person so it is 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 a very fine balance we have to keep i think especially in this day and age because one thing one thing uh i've seen especially with uh the emergence of groups like isis is people who have uh left their homes, left their spouses, left their kids, sometimes taking the kids, uh, left their spouse and gone, even women. I was watching uh, on Vice News uh, just before we started this uh, a Skype call, um, you know, a sad story. He, uh, he came home one day, his wife was radicalized online. She took uh, the young kids and she went to Syria. And he was trying to find his kids and he couldn't find them. After so many years, so it's it's uh, because it's very easy for someone to fall, I think, into such a trap. I think Sheikh Imran Hussein has 
has spoken about uh, things like ISIS being almost like a honey trap, uh, uh, something that's going to bring all these young, angry Muslims who have seen years and years of uh, humiliation against uh, Muslimin across the globe. Because at the at the at the moment is is a very it's very hard to to talk about these issues and and for someone just to say oh you're just sitting and talking about it all talk no action so is is how do you think we should um, tackle such issues where we are talking about serious issues but not to go too uh, depressed almost but not to totally forget them <laughs> and your experience yeah. is what what's the best approach and what do you recommend people who who don't want to go crazy who might not have the mental capacity or m- mental fortitude to handle such uh such information what what would you recommend especially from a psycho- psych- psychology background yes yeah, subhanallah you really really touched upon i think a really crucial issue subhanallah uh, I, I sometimes get surprised when I hear, you know, people write on my comments also in my videos. Um, and I realize that, you know, a lot of people are, it, it's not like the mature attitude towards a lot of what's going on. It's rather either A, uh, there's a lot of anger, mm-hmm. or B, there's a lot of phobia. And, and then the other side is described as if they're gods right as if like everything they plan happens and 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 you know this kind of like phobia like you know they're and 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 kind of like it's not how things are in the real world so i think you you said it correctly that there's i guess some information that they they have a really hard time processing uh seeing what's happening in the muslim world and i i think that you know the news uh in general has either made people angry or depressed and kind of like i just don't want to deal with it or just a level of phobia that is just um that in their mind it's like they're dealing with an a, a power that can never be countered kind of thing mm-hmm. um my answer to that is that if you're it, without spirituality without deep, deep spirituality, uh, it's going to be very hard to deal with these issues, even at a psychological level. You have to have, uh, you have to have sabr, and you have to have, and sabr means spirituality, because that, uh, as far as, oh, we're not doing anything, we're doing things in accordance to what we can do at any given time, right? So we need to have that discussion. I mean, that discussion is, is, is that critique may be partially true, that we do need to have a discussion of what are the things that we can do? Uh, what are the things that we can uh, make a difference on and so on and so forth. But I do think that a lot of the people that are aware of what's happening in the world, they themselves are uh, dealing with some sort of internal trauma or, you know, just uh, some sort of uh, a, a high level of anxiety, of anxiety, phobia, or being, de- and those that are not are depressed, or those, a lot of them are just simply trying to, and this is really the essence of the, pow- of the issue. Um, we want Muslims to get on their feet, not because we want Allah to be happy. We want Muslims to get on their feet and to have power because we're angry and because of our own uh, takabur, so to say, our own pride, our own proudness. And so while it is, you know, very serious that we have to establish the deen of Allah and we have to establish uh, the laws of Allah on earth and we have to establish, uh, you know, an Islamic army and an emir and all of those are serious issues but it can't be done uh, for the sake of uh, making me feel good that uh, I have now vindicated myself now that we have Muslim power 
la yuridun aluwan fil ard we have to be those people who we're not after power and the prophet was not after power he was not after power when he was in Mecca for 12 long years doing sabr and just teaching and teaching and taking it all there was where was the rage of umar in Mecca where was the rage of hamza in Mecca when the companions were being killed when yasir and sumayya are being killed and they're being tortured or where is Omar? The Prophet comes to them and says, Isbiru ya ala Yasir. Oh, people, family of Yasir, have patience, have sabr. The Prophet's not telling Omar, okay, let's, you know, go and, and beat these guys up and uh, let's take our revenge. It wasn't about revenge. And I think that those of us who are obsessed with the news, a lot of times we're trying to look for that you know, different aspects of our mind, but part of it is we want that revenge. We don't want Islam necessarily for the sake of making Allah happy, but a lot of it has to do with because we want, we want, we, we are reacting out of anger, we want revenge. And so, you know, the Prophet's in Mecca, right? And, you know, one of the differences between the seerah of the Prophet and the seerah of Ibrahim, is the Prophet's in Mecca with the idols right there. Right? And he's praying in Mecca with the idols right there. He didn't break any of them. Imagine the amount of sabr you need for that. Mm -hmm. Imagine that a companion of the Prophet becomes Muslim and he realizes, wait, <laughs> these idols are nothing. You know, he could get angry and start breaking them. But the Prophet said, Kufu aidiakum, keep your hands tied, don't retaliate. So I think that it is uh, extremely, extremely important that. Um, that we look at the seerah of the Prophet and, and, and we understand how he did things. And the Prophet, uh, actually a statement of Abu Bakr, uh, The last part of this ummah will not be reformed except in the same pattern that it was reformed in the beginning. So we, we have to go through the Makki phase and we have to take the persecution and only that will give, when, when we have made Allah happy, then Allah will provide us space and Allah will uh, provide us the ability then to uh, have Medina, you can say. But uh, I do think that without spirituality, uh, trying to, you know, and, and, and it, it's, it's, we also do this for our own group therapy. It's a group therapy. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, and you see this at parties, too, with uncles, right? A bunch of uncles talking about the politics in Pakistan, right? As if they're going to solve all the problem. And, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, particularly uh, Muslims from the Indian subcontinent, you know, we, we, we love politics. Uh, and, 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 but but it's, it's not that you're going to solve anything. What's actually happening is it's just a group therapy. You mm. get to get out your frustrations and say this should have happened and not this should have happened and I support this or whatever it is. Uh, it's just group therapy and that goes to prove, that goes to prove that you need therapy, which goes to prove you need the spirituality. Without the spirituality, we're not going to be moving forward in a positive way. We're just going to be reacting to our own quote unquote demons within. So in addition to uh, that, you know, instead, instead of just you reading the news or just doing things online or just listening to things online on YouTube, you have to be doing something practically on the ground. You know, you can, uh, you have to be, you, you have to be thinking globally, but you have to be acting locally. And so you have to be doing the da'wah work, the community work, the, uh, teaching in different forms or uh, gathering people in different ways or trying to live off, the, whatever, live off the grid, um, establish jama. But you have to be involved. I think it's a problem when all that you're doing is something online and reading the news and then you're not doing anything practically speaking. You're not doing that will work. You're not doing community work. You're not involved in any practical way. Then that becomes it. Uh, also, uh, I've noticed a lot of the brothers and sisters that are reading the news 
and obsessed with it is because they actually need to, it's like uh, an escapism for them. Because, you know, maybe they lost their job or they got divorced or um, maybe some other problem in their life that they're facing. And mm -hmm. so now this is their escapism, is to blame the world. Back to the Hadith uh, situation, because they're, they're people who even deny the, the Jal, the Antichrist. They say it's from Christian converts in early Islam who brought this ideology into Islam. Because uh, one, of, one, one of the points they gave is the Jal is not mentioned in the Quran. What would you say to people who say it's from early Christian converts? That is not uh, uh, actual Islamic tradition taught by the Prophet, peace be upon him. And second being, um, what have you seen in the world that would lead you to believe or will you um, show people or give examples to convince them of uh, Dajjal? It's uh, very simple. The Quran does not talk about Dajjal, you're right. But Quran does talk about Ya'juj and Ma'juj. And to say that... Uh, See, it's kind of like saying, uh, oh, the Quran talks about salah, but it doesn't talk about, for example, saying subhana rabbi al-a'la. Well, if the salah is there, then it also contains what's under it, right? What is What comes under it is already part of that. Let me actually answer that in two different, uh, two, another question you asked, what about uh, the coming back of Jesus in Quran? Let me also touch upon that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I think you can make a logical conclusion that if Jesus is coming back, then what's the reason for him to come back? I'm going to talk about that, but I'm also going to talk about what you asked about the Dajjal um, being in Quran. I was saying that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are mentioned in Quran, and the Dajjal is a subcategory of that. Meaning, the Dajjal is the result is the result of certain things Ya'juj and Ma'juj do. So, if you study Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the conclusion of studying Ya'juj and Ma'juj is, is whether you, even if you don't have the concept of Dajjal as mentioned in the tradition of the Prophet Wasallam, if you, let's say if, there, if we, again, remove the Hadith literature for a minute, if you just study the parts of Qur'an, the two parts of Qur'an in particular, that talk about Ya'juj and Ma'juj, the result would be the same. There's no denying that there will be some catastrophe in the world in which every city will be in difficulty. Right? That's in the Quran. So, uh, <clears throat> that there will be wars. Uh, warn you of a severe punishment is one translation, but a better translation, warn you of a severe war. So, there's no, there's no doubt Quran points to uh, a time in which there will be great uh, wars. Number one. Number two, the coming back of Jesus uh you know there are three four things about that number one the indication that jesus will come back is very clear when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-imran yu'allimuhumu al-kitaba wal hikma hikma we know is what in all of the traditions one of the meanings of the word hikma is the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and al-kitab is quran dhalika al-kitab because we're not talking about a book you know if it said al if it says al kitab the book the final book is quran so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 48 wal hikma he will teach him the book and hikma hikma meaning wisdom which is the quran yasin wal quran al hakim but more specifically the wisdom is the sunnah of the prophet now even people that uh so and then he will teach them also torah teach meaning jesus torah and injil so you have the quran the hikmah however you translate hikmah and then torah and injil this can only happen meaning how can jesus learn quran he, how can he learn the book he can only learn it if he comes back number one number two uh of course, Quran says what usually people talk about, but you also have in Surah Al-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in Kitab, there is none amongst the people of the book, except they will believe in him, 
meaning Jesus. Min qabli, maw, min qabli mawtihi, before his death. Now, why is the death of Jesus being mentioned? So, this qabla, uh, qabla mawtihi yaw, uh, yawm al Before his death, before the day of judgment, all the, pe the people of the book will believe in him. This can only happen if he's actually there present. And, you know, uh, people believe in him before his death. It can only happen if he's actually there. And these things are from Quran. You know, this I think is ayah number um, 159 of Surah An-Nisa. They will definitely believe in him, uh, the people of Ahlul Kitab. Min qabla mawtihi. Okay. Before his death. Wa yawm al-qiyamati yakunu alayhim shahida. And he will be a... Uh, he will be a witness upon them. Now, before his death, if it happened the first time, the people of the book didn't believe in him. So when, when is this talking about that people of the book will believe in him? Meaning the Jews and the Christians, when will they, they didn't believe in him the first time when he left. So this can only be referring to when he comes back. And of course, the ayah in Surah Al-Imran, يُكَلِّمُ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَحْدِ وَالْكَحْلَ He will talk to the people in in the cradle and, and also in the old age. Mm -hmm. So the indication is there in Quran. Mm -hmm. Another thing I want to share with you, you will find very interesting. And this is a whole subject in itself. And one day I'm going to I make a video about it. But a lot of times Quran and Sunnah, the Sunnah of the Prophet and the Quran have very complementary uh, nature. OK, I'll give you an example. Hadith literature uses the word niya, intention. Quran doesn't use the word niya. Quran uses a different word, ikhlas. Mukhlisina lahuddin, mukhlisina lahuddin, mukhlisina lahuddin. You see this in Quran, this word. You find the word intention in the hadith literature. So you find these types of, you know, uh, relationships between Quran and hadith in at least 40, 50 different subjects. Where one aspect is being emphasized in Quran, and another aspect is being emphasized in hadith literature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another example of that is the word jihad. The word jihad, when it's used by the Prophet, it means it in, in the in what Quran calls qital. Yuqatiluna fi sabilil. Quran doesn't use the word jihad for what we usually understand the word jihad for. Yuqatiluna fi sabilil. They fight in the path of Allah. The word in Quran is qital mostly. The word jihad is general, any struggle. They do struggle with themselves, with their wealth and with themselves. In fact, you find the word jihad in Quran for the non-Muslims. If they do jihad against you, the parents, they do jihad. If the parents do jihad against you, about which you have no knowledge, meaning making shirk with Allah, then don't obey them. The word jihad is general in Quran. In, in the Quran, wajahid bihi jihad and kabira. Do jihad with this, meaning Quran. Do jihad with Quran. This is in Surah Al Furqan. Wajahid bihi jihad and kabira. Make a big jihad with this Quran, mm -hmm. meaning promoting it, promoting it, promoting the ideas of Quran. Make a big jihad of this Quran. Wajahid, mm -hmm. the word is jihad. But the word Quran uses generally for fighting, for war, is qital. Mm -hmm. But the hadith literature uses the word jihad. Again, this kind of like complementary nature that exists between the mm -hmm. two. And there's many, many examples of this. Coming, they say coming events cast their shadows. Which basically means that you see the same thing as the original, but in a smaller microscopic scale. Right? So if, if it's about my experience, then I will say that you can see a microscope, a microscopic level of deception that is increasing more and more before our eyes. Is there any doubt about that? And is there any doubt that this is going to increase? Meaning from when I was in my 20s to where we are today, just to let you know the difference, right? When we would say things like, you know, 
uh, Israel is going to become a world power and Israel is going to make Jerusalem its capital and they're going to build the third temple. 20 years ago, people would be looking at us and making fun of us. Like, what are you talking about? Right? And uh, now, if you say this, it's, a, it's part of reality. There's no debating this. When the original scholars, when Sheikh Imran Hussein started talking, you know, people don't, people don't appreciate the fact that he started talking about this stuff almost 30 years ago, when people couldn't even see these things. And Dr. Isra Ahmed, same thing. He was talking about things, the, the punishment that would come to the Arab world. And all these things, we were, they were talking about this stuff when we were younger. I mean, I was very young at that time. But they were talking about this. The people would be like, oh, well, you know, what is he talking about? And, you know, now the world has changed so much that now you, people actually look back and say, oh, wow, okay, they guessed it right. Mm -hmm. And so, again, coming events cast their shadows. The nucleus of this ummah is consisting of the Arabs. The Ummiyin, the non-Arab Muslims, they constitute the electrons this, that are surrounding this nucleus. And the responsibility of the Arabs is much greater than the responsibility of the other Muslims. They are more responsible. They will get more reward if they go on the right path. But they will be punished more severely if they take to the wrong path. Which I said, you know, in the last uh, previous uh, session, that this is going to come very soon, you know. The Holocaust and the Malahim, Kitabul Malahim, full chapter in the books of the Ahadis about the wars which are going to come very soon. And it is very correct, whosoever might, might have said it, but the wordings are correct that the Gulf War was the mother of wars. It's the beginning of a long series of wars. The Armageddon, the greatest and the biggest uh, fight and war of the human race, human history is going to be fought. That is called Armageddon in the last chapter of Bible, that is the Revelations. And Prophet ﷺ has named it Al-Malhamatul Uzma, the greatest war that is to take place. And that will be in the Middle East. That is going to start. As far as I assess, as I told you last evening, within two or three years, Masjid Al-Aqsa will be demolished. Why? It's so simple. So logical. It is for them what is Kaaba to us. For 1924 years, it is lying raised to the ground. Only one wall remains, a part of one wall, which they call the Wailing Wall. They go there, weep there, and you know, they mourn there and come back. Their Temple of Solomon, their Qibla, their Kaaba, lying raised to the ground. How can they bear it? They did it. Why? Because they were powerless. They were in diaspora. They were scattered throughout the world. They had no power, no strength. But now they have a land of their own. They have their feet very strongly on that soil. And nobody, no country in the close region is powerful enough to challenge them. None of them. Only Iraq, could have atomic teeth, there was a danger that atomic teeth can grow to this country. And what happened to that country, everybody knows. So actually, at least in the closed region, there's none who can oppose or challenge his right. So why don't they? Why should they? I have brought that map today, of which I was telling you many times, you know. You can see after the prayer of Maghrib, this is the, the, uh, the architect's presentation of that after the demolition of Masjid al-Aqsa, this will be the form of the Temple of Solomon that is going to be built. And you must have heard, if you have not heard, let me tell you, because this of Masjid al-Aqsa is being renovated at this time, you must have heard or read the news that it, they needed a few months, I, I don't know the exact amount, of gold for the plating of the dome. And for that, King Hussein of Jordan has sold a palace of his in London to buy that gold. And the Jews, this Time magazine, you know, it published that the Jews are saying, okay, this gold will be used by us. But we shall reconstruct our Temple of Solomon 
we shall use this gold for the dome of that temple of Solomon. So these are the sealers. They are publishing these things. So that the Muslim Ummah, you know, it, it becomes accustomed to it. And this thing doesn't come to them as a very uh, strange surprise. So that is their, their subtle way of making something, you know, known so that they don't take it as a very surprise and they don't not, not react very violently. Um, also, I want you to consider this. That from a purely political perspective, if you look at the outer world, they have the oil, they have the resources, they have the population, they have the money, they have everything. They have the younger generation, which is good for their economics. And you have this small little country, Israel. Small little country. And it has no oil as of yet. They might get it from Golan Heights. I don't know. You know. And it, it has a small population. Why does America side with Israel over all of these benefits of siding with the Arab world? And the answer is because deep, deep down, religion plays a role in our lives. And so the average American, the average American politician who is being who gets his votes from the Christian right, which is the Republican Party, uh, they're voting because you know what, part of the right wing, uh, you know, you could say agenda is that we have to support the chosen people of God, and this is we have to build a third temple. I mean, this is a Christian agenda too, and so uh, if you don't look at it anyway. You know, you should read the book. It's called Forcing God's Hands. That's the name of the book. Okay, and this is written by a secular person. He's not a Muslim. He's not anything. He's a secular person who is very scared about where the world is going. And he's basically like, our politics, the politics of America, and the right-wing politics is pushing those prophecies to come through, if not in any way, at least they're manufacturing these things to force them to come true. Forcing God's hands is the name of the book. So kind of like forcing God's hands in a certain direction. So either you can look at it, things are moving in a certain direction because of divine will, or you can look at it, things are moving in a certain direction because some people are forcing, trying to force quote unquote God's hands. Mm -hmm. But there's no doubt that the world is headed towards a direction of wars, destruction, control, wars over water, wars over resources, and so on and so forth. And more and more stupider people are becoming our leaders. And, you know, Trump is a small example of that. Um, so coming events cast their shadows. For me, um, the subject of the Dijal, the Antichrist, was something, uh, there was a tape uh, going around when I was around 10 years old this tape was called Shadows in yeah, Motion. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, it had a great impact. I had the audio cassette. Yeah. And I was in the first year of high school. Uh, I got hold of this cassette from some uh, faraway relatives. It really, you know, intrigued me. I listened to that cassette so many times. I made copies of it. I gave it around in school. And friends, years later, they would say, oh, you were the first one to talk about this stuff. Yeah. So it was something that intrigued me and I've looked into over the years. It was something I always read up on and uh, I bought a book by Ahmad Thompson. Uh, oh, you read that too. That's right. His the, book, the Dijad. Dijad. People who might not even be Muslim, you know, they, they can't deny people who might not even be into quote unquote conspiracy theory can't deny the, the obviously according to the Hadith or the Prophet, peace be upon him, that the Dajjal will be one-eyed. And the one-eyed symbolism has intrigued, and more non-Muslims have done work on this than Muslims, on these subjects. And the non-Muslims have done more research and maybe added more, uh, have polluted the waters almost in this topic. Because this, this one-eyed symbolism, especially in music, or is is always been there almost with with the uh, Western 
Western music with the yeah, I mean, music see, which emerged. Now, in. That, that's a good example of coming events cast their shadows, mm -hmm. which is that how come this one eye all of a sudden begins to appear in entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And just gets more and more and more. We didn't have cartoons with one eyes before. Now you see like it's normal to make these figures with one eyes and cartoon and stuff. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, subhanAllah, mm -hmm. it's... With, uh, with, with, with the music industry, especially in America, this, this emerged very early. But over the years, uh, for, uh, it's, it's been more prevalent in the kids' cartoons, in cartoons in general, in, in films, in magazines. And now we're seeing it. We've got cooks, chefs doing this pose. Uh, we have a Muslim chef from England. Uh, she's doing a one-eye pose on, one, uh, on the cover of uh, a cookbook. And she's Muslim. She probably knows what this symbol means. But in that moment when the when the photographer is telling her to pose like this, to pose like that, they're probably doing a photo shoot for two hours, taking 200 pictures. She probably doesn't even remember some of the poses. And, and the, the misconception, I, I believe, uh, what a lot of people have given online is someone who covers their eye, who is doing the, this one eye symbol, this one eye symbolism, uh, this one eye pose, they are part of something called the Illuminati. And I think this is a, a misconception. All the people who are doing this, I think m majority of them are oblivious to what they're doing. This is almost uh, a joke. You know, like how jinns are mischievous. They make yeah, exactly. people do things and they yeah. laugh at them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. this is a joke yeah. to them. Yes. Pl uh, which I refer to. These people doing this one I sign are pledging their allegiance to the Dajjal, doing this sign. And I, I, I believe majority of these, of these people have no clue, have no clue. Because when they go to a photo shoot, these people are, 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 are there for sometimes two hours, three hours, posing in this way, posing that way, maybe taking 200 pictures. But they might not even realize what they're doing. And but when you see these magazine publications, especially publications publications like ID magazine, every month they'll have musicians one eye pose, one eye pose, one hand covering one eye. Wow, well, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and it's it's people who are not into conspiracy, who are not Muslim. They see this and they'll be like, "What's going on?" And people have to be very careful not making quick assumptions that someone sold their soul. Uh, they made a deal with the devil. That's why they've got the one eye. Um, I think a lot of these people are very oblivious. They're just trying to make a living. Especially these musicians are are not living such a, a a free life. Maybe it might be glamorous in certain aspects, but they're not free at all. They 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 have contracts on their heads. They have loans on their heads. Basically, a mortgage they have they have to pay off to these people. Uh, who advance them the money uh, in the record labels. With something like this, where it's so prevalent, especially on my Instagram page, I've got, you know, pictures I'll put up uh, uh, on magazines and photo shoots of uh, actors and musicians. But over the years, it's, it's become more prevalent. Like I said, they have chefs doing this one eye pose. They have uh, scientists, uh, people in science. They have uh, uh, the astronaut um, Buzz Aldrin doing this pose. Mm -hmm. And... And for someone to see this, they know, okay, this is, what's, this, what's this pose? And I, I think it'll be interesting for someone who has done this pose to come out and say what exactly was going on. But I haven't seen any interviews of anyone saying why they've done such a pose. For people to believe in the idea of the Dajjal <coughs> is someone called Jack Parsons, who was a scientist who was deeply into the occult, deeply. And he had visions where uh, he, he had, you could say, demons, jinn, paired to him. I believe he started calling himself the embodiment of uh, Balerian al-Dajjal. And this was someone many, many years ago, probably didn't even know about Islam. Probably mm -hmm. had, uh, you know, especially in them days, how did he know about something called Dajjal? Mm. The father of the space age. That's what he called. You know what he said? I'm not the father of the space age. That's the real father of the space age. 
Okay, now this guy who was at Cal Poly Tech, right? This guy, Jack Parsons, was openly a devil worshiper. He developed the fuel that enabled us to penetrate the stratosphere. Satellites could not have come about without this guy. In his diary that he himself wrote, he had a dream. This is 1948. He had a dream where he saw somebody that he calls Belial Dajjal. And he tells him, you are helping me. Okay, I'm not making this up. You think I'm making this up? Wallahi, I'm not making this up. You go look it up yourself. Okay, so where's all this stuff coming from? Where's all, seriously, where's it all coming from? <laughs> We're in the age of the Dajjal, you know. It's just Allahu Anam, when and where and what, but this is it, people. As far as I'm concerned, it's end game. Huh? You know, but the, the technology, if you study where all this technology comes from, okay, read about the magic and the enlightenment period. All these scientists were magicians. They were all into black magic. You read about uh, Francis Bacon. He, I, I just read a, a, a biography of Francis Bacon called Knowledge is Power, Magic and, and, and the Creation of Modern Science. Francis Bacon was reading all these magical books. 2001 Space Odyssey, what's his name? Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, great technologist. He actually uh, has most of the patents that enabled the satellites, right? If you look at his interview with BBC in 1961, where he predicts the internet, he predicts uh, the cell phones, he predicts uh, texting. He said that by the year 2000, people are going to have handheld devices that enable them to talk to anybody anywhere, right? Arthur C. Clarke said, and he has three laws of technology. One of his laws is no technology reaches a level of, of complexity except it becomes indistinguishable from magic. People who, like I said, like people who are non-Muslims are working on these subjects, add, polluting the waters by giving a lot of false assumptions, especially when something is hidden, we can only speculate. We can only speculate what's going on behind doors. We don't know what's going on, what deals they might do, what deals they might not do. We can only speculate. This, this is where the problem lies. Because people, for example, don't believe in God because they want, they, they want 100% proof. Prove to me there's a God. Show me God, they say. So certain people will not believe. But certain people will see the evidence, the footsteps of certain people and a lot of these photographers, uh, a lot of photographers, a lot of people in uh, the entertainment industry are, 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 are Satanists. We know this. Yeah. They, 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 uh, they dabble in Satanism and the whole lifestyle which is promoted is Satanism. And uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf said in one of his speeches when he's, when he's showing uh, a, a slideshow of uh, um, these characters and these uh, uh, musicians and actors doing the one I pose. He, he stumped himself. He said, well, what's going on here? And he said, this is demonic inspiration. Now, here, the Prophet said, I'm going, he said, I'm warning you that every prophet came and they warned their people about the Dajjal. But I'm going to tell you something about the Dajjal that nobody said to their people. He has one eye and God does not have one eye. Now, I find it very bizarre that this cult of one eye is so prevalent in popular culture. Everywhere you look, the, the cult of one eye, and there you have Eminem, this minion with his devil's horns and his one eye plastered on the streets of Toronto. You can say, you know, I'm not talking about a conspiracy. A lot of people don't know what this is about. They don't know. Like these cartoonists aren't all plotting and things like this. This is all inspiration. It's demonic inspiration. They're inspired by shaitan. If you want to know who's at the root of this conspiracy, it's, it's an unseen world that we're dealing with. St. Paul said that our, our, our struggle is not with the powers of flesh and blood, but principalities of darkness. That this is part of the struggle of the people of God as they fight against forces of darkness that want to bring human beings down. Why? Have you ever seen anybody do that? Have you ever taken a picture like that? 
Who would take a picture like that? Why would you do that? I've never seen anybody do that. Why would you do that? Why? Why, why is this all this one eye obsession? What's going on? For someone who is, doesn't know anything about the Dajjal to make other people do this pose or, or design characters with one eye, maybe this is the most logical explanation for us Muslims is this is demonic inspiration. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think? Absolutely. The Quran mentions this, you know, about uh, about demonic inspirations. The shayateen, they go and they give inspirations to people to move in a negative way and to do these negative gestures, so on and so forth. It's definitely there. Mm -hmm. What uh, uh, I wanted to share with you is that Surah Al-Kahf, interestingly enough, if you look at the main theme of the entire surah, there are two things that are very interesting. One is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the, uh, you can say the fadila or the Superiority is maybe not the perfect word, but the, the blessings of non-prophets. So you have the Ashab al-Kahab, for example. You have the man in the garden who is saying, maybe Allah will get rid of this, and it happens. You have then Musa and Khidr in, in, in this you know very strange event in which a non-prophet is teaching a prophet, right? And you have uh, Zulqarnain, who is a non-prophet doing great things uh, for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one, but this is not the main theme, but this is a, an interesting aspect of it because the jal will come at a time where there will be no prophets, but uh, some non-prophets, some people close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they may do some extraordinary things. Second thing, the main theme of this surah is don't fall for the materialistic world. That's the main theme of the surah. You know, these seven sleepers, the point is there that these, this world of asbab, the world of cause and effect, this doesn't always have to be. Then you have, uh, after the ashab al-kahaf, the second thing that's mentioned, actually, it's between the lines. You know, you, two things are between the lines. One is the Prophet, this is the surah that tells the Prophet to say, Don't say I'll do something tomorrow. Don't rely on your asbab. Don't rely on your causes in, in the world of cause and effect. Say, Illa mashallah. If Allah wills, things happen that are not necessarily in the world of cause and effect designed to happen. And then you have the story of uh, Iblis and Adam. Because what Iblis didn't see is the ruh. He saw the material aspect of man. And he, on that he said, I'm better than him. And I'm better than him because he was looking at the material aspect of man. Then you have the man in the garden. Again, the point is, you may have the best trees and the best irrigation system, but if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to get rid of something, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will get rid of it. Then you have the story of Musa and Khidr. We all know about that and also the story of uh, Zulqarnain. And the interesting about Zulqarnain is Atba'a Sababa. He followed all asbabs, right? But there were things in his life and in his travels that were beyond asbab, beyond the world of cause and effect. So this surah, the main theme is that don't rely on asbab. Don't rely on this world. Don't rely on the materialism. And the biggest shirk of this time is the shirk of materialism. Mm -hmm. um, when, you know, when the man lost the garden, you know what he said? Ya laytani lam ushrik bi rabbi. I wish I didn't do shirk with Allah. Mm -hmm. um, We've made this world our God with the robots and everything. And we think, you know, everything can be calculated and everything can be predicted and so on and so forth. Uh, well, one of the things... I wanted to uh, speak on. Um, uh, th there was a video which you uploaded about a person. I think he was suffering from is this schizophrenia. He had yeah. some serious mental issues. 
No, just talk to me. Okay. Okay. So, so I'm I'm down with schizophrenia. I have schizophrenia. Right. Yeah. So, so these voices that you hear in your head, mm -hmm. they're always negative. They're going to tell you to do suicide, hurt yourself. Um, they're going to tell you. They're going to sometimes praise you and sometimes bring you down and tell you you're nothing. If you don't do what they want, they start mm -hmm. making fun of you. Have you seen that? Some, some, sometimes, like, sometimes they laugh at me. Some, sometimes they, they, they just down me. Like I, have, I, like, I have a positive thought, and they just down that positive thought, and it just, like, knocks all, all my dreams away. So, you know, these voices you hear, they're, they're, they're not your friends. Sometimes they act like your friends, and sometimes they play good cop, bad cop. Okay. So some of these voices will pretend like, oh, we like you, and other voices will be like, we don't like you. And they'll fight with each other at times, but none of them are your friends. Okay. They're just playing good cop, bad cop. Okay. Right? Some of them may like something about you, but they don't like you overall. They don't like people around you. They always cause fights with people around you. Uh, they, they cause people around you to disrespect you. Uh, at least in your mind, that's what they'll tell you. Oh, this person doesn't like you. Like, they might tell you, I don't know if they can talk to you while you're around me. Okay. But can you hear them right now? Not right now. It's okay. Not right now. Okay. So, um, how are you feeling right now? I feel better since I came here today. Okay. A lot better. A lot better. So, um, okay. Very good. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of cash. No, no, it's okay. I'm... No, no, no. You can keep that. Okay. Yeah. Would you have a job right now? No, I don't have a job. Are you looking for a job? Uh, well, I'm supposedly in around August time, so I got a goal. Go do some programs to get a job. All right. All right. So you could stay. Do you want to eat something? Do you want to drink something? I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm right. You sure? Do you have a phone? I have a house phone number, but I got to get a landline phone. I don't even know my number. I just moved out here. You just moved out here. Yeah, as I said, next Friday, I'll come back next Friday. Okay. So um, remember, those voices, mm -hmm. what are you going to do with them? Be rude to them. And don't believe in anything that they say. Okay. Okay. You only believe what's written in this book. Okay. Okay. And you only believe in the Lord or the God or Allah. Okay. Who created you. Who created Muslims, Christians, Jews. He created all of us. Okay. He created the jinns. He created the men. Right. We don't listen to those voices and believe them. Okay. Just because we can't see them doesn't mean that they're special in any way. They're actually very small. Mm -hmm. They're very powerless, but the only power they have is to talk to our brains. Okay. Okay? Um, and so, and I want you to pray to God. Okay. Turn to God, pray to God. Read this book, mm -hmm. read like five to ten pages, mm -hmm. and then pray to God. And then read five to ten pages, and then pray to God. Okay. If you do what I'm saying, your life will change. Okay. Okay? Okay. All right. Um, Craig. Craig, nice to meet you. Like, my, my dad is a Muslim. Your dad's a Muslim. Yeah, my whole father's side of family are Muslims. Okay, mashallah. So when I was a young child, yeah, everybody called me Muhammad. Okay, okay, mashallah. And they, they stuck with me. So, so your name is Muhammad. Yeah, because of my father. Right. But my, my, my like my, my birth certificate is he's Craig. Okay. Like everybody calls me Muhammad since I was a baby. Okay. My dad's a Muslim. Okay. Well, so. you're welcome over here anytime. Okay. Okay. I want you to get on your feet. I want you to get a job. Uh -huh. You have to do the hard work. Okay. There's no shortcuts. Okay. No shortcuts. No excuses. Okay. Okay. How old are you? Thirty-seven. Thirty-seven. Yeah. This is you. You know. You know life. You've been around. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, give me a hug. Okay. And uh, see you. If you're serious, you'll be here next week. I will. Okay. All right. You have a good day. All right. Sound like cool. How the effects of the gin on humans? How how do they affect us? And obviously, from the Quran, we know. The waswisa, the whispering of the jinn, <laughs> the influences uh, of the jinn. Um, in your experience of, of uh, similar experiences that you had uh, with this individual, you had uh, what other experiences experiences have you had to maybe show someone, prove to someone that these entities are real and the effects they have? That's one question. Uh, second question. There are some, even Muslims, that don't believe in demonic possession. And I would like to know your position on, on this. Um, okay, let me say a few things. Uh, any word 
that has even a noon in it or or just within its uh, root word the idea is something that is hidden from others okay like jannah is a garden it's like a residential garden that's a private not 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 just a, meaning it's a garden that's protected with trees around it and so on and so forth jinan is like the uh, the fetus in the womb so jinn and also relating to majnun so jinn uh, we'll talk about in a second but majnun means obviously as we know someone who's gone crazy majnun also means someone who is possessed that's why you'll find both of these translations even in the english language someone who's gone mad yani wa ma anta bi ni'mati rabbika bi majnun and by the grace of allah you are not majnun meaning you haven't gone crazy and the other is uh, you are not possessed so the reason i point this out is that it's hard to detect because the very essence of it is something that's trying to hide having said that <clears throat> uh I don't know how to explain it in a conversation like this but it is very clear to me at this point uh anyone suffering from schizophrenia bipolar maniac multiple personality I mean there there's um a book uh let me actually look it up very quickly and you can also look it up on your side it's called uh girl interrupted um but when people when people change personalities uh in multiple personalities uh you'll find something very interesting uh and that is hold on i'm looking up this book interrupted okay girl interrupted uh i think uh it is girl interrupted Yes. So, so what I was trying to sh- uh, share with you is that when people have mer- multiple personalities, they really have multiple personalities. I mean, their IQ changes. Sometimes uh there've been known cases where they speak different languages uh like fluently. Right? Their IQ changes, their pupil changes, their personality changes. So now let's talk about for a second modern medicine okay? modern medicine is best when it comes to things like e- er you have an emergency this is like their like in, in a scale of what they're best at to worst they're best at er and critical care <clears throat> there's been nothing like that in history but they're absolutely the worst when it comes to taking care of mental issues i mean just the worst the the record is really really bad and 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 in fact i'll be talking about that at some point but psychology has really failed to really provide solutions so what do we do uh when somebody has um you know multiple personality or schizophrenia what do we do we turn off their brain so where the waswasa is and this is very important it's to understand where is the waswasa happening i'll just give you some examples from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the prophet said when somebody is sleeping the shaitan comes and pees in your ear well what does it mean you see shayatin are actually very small that's why he's able to fit into your ear and pee in it their strength isn't how big they are there you know even quran says very clearly in surah safat we have this you know imaginative idea of jinns we think jinns are very big they're actually not very big majority of them 99.99% of jinns are actually very very small so the quran says fastaftihim ask them meaning the jinns fastaftihim ahum ashaddu khalqan are they a stronger creation am man khalaqna or the one that we created meaning are they the jinns the stronger creator the one that i created with my own hand so allah says fastaftihim ahum ashaddu khalqan am man khalaqna inna khalaqnahu min tin lazim and we created him with sticky clay so the one who is created of sticky clay is stronger and a more serious creation than the jinns um now <clears throat> why i'm saying i'm saying this is to understand the hadith of the prophet that the shaitan pees in your ears 
or the other hadith where he sits in your nose. And all of these ahadiths uh, and many others, they point to the fact that the main place where shaitan attacks you is in your, uh, we can say your brain area, okay? Uh, when, uh, when, when somebody dies, their, the brain waves stop. Our brain is basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an object, meaning the brain, but it's functionally, it's waves. When you're sleeping, there's waves. When you're waking up, when you're awake, there are different waves. And it is these waves that shaitan is, you know, you waswisu. Waswasa is an interesting word. And, it, you know, and it doesn't use the word qalb, which is also very interesting. The Quran uses the word sadr. You waswisu fi sudurin. And sadr literally means, uh, you know, sadr and qalb. I'm not going to go into the difference. I won't go into, into that right now. But the only point I'm trying to make is... Jinns are small, and majority of the times they're attacking your brain waves or this area where your thoughts are. Okay, so that's even a more simplified way of understanding it. He does waswasa, he gives suggestions, or is, you hear yourself talking, but it's not really you talking. Um, you hear these thoughts, and these thoughts are from actually shaitan being injected into your brain. To make you anger, angry, or to make you depressed, or to, or something like this. We cannot prove if there is a jinn, but what we do know, like as a fact, uh, whether you agree that there is a, a jinn or not, uh, there is a famous, probably, I think, from an Islamic perspective, the most important Western psychologist. Uh, there are two of them that are very important. William James is very important in the psychology of religion. But another person who is extremely important, I mean, this person's work is phenomenal. This person knew the Quran. He had dreams about Islam. And he was a student of Freud and challenged Freud through and through. Um, his name was Carl Jung. Have you heard of him? Yeah. yeah him. Carl Jung is just such an awesome psychologist. And... <clears throat> There is no doubt about his idea. Now, th listen to what I'm about to say. He says that we innately have some archetypes. We innately have these, this type of knowledge within. You know, and I'll give you an example. The wise man. Just take the idea of the wise man. Every culture understands. Every culture respects. Every culture understands the idea of a wise man. Every culture respects and understands the idea of a warrior or a hero, right? This, this is innate in human beings. You see this universally across cultures. You see this universally across, uh, you know, civilizations, across time. So there are those things that are common between us. And this is very interesting. The field of psychology has been... Um, the field of psychology has been uh, antagonistic towards anthropology uh, because the two, even though studying human beings, have many times come up to very different conclusions. You know, just like you have issues in chemistry and physics where they don't see eye to eye on how the ions move, for example. Um, so you have also within the social sciences that one branch of social science sees a certain issue a certain way and another branch sees it completely different. Now in psychology, the general view of the human beings was that we are generally speaking a byproduct of our environment and our genes. Okay? <clears throat> but anthropology was showing us something quite different. Anthropology was showing us that no, there's a lot of common things between us. Anthropology was showing us that, look, all cultures have a divine. All cultures have stories. All cultures have heroes. All cultures, you know, ha and all cultures, all civilizations have a concept of the, you, what Carl Jung called the dark shadow or the shadow. Okay. So there's something 
kind of like within us. Whether you agree shaitan, don't agree shaitan, I'm not talking about that right now. I'm completely talking from an academic perspective. From an empirical point of view, it is a fact that all cultures across all times have believed in something, some dark force within. Okay? And that's manifested in, in different names, different uh, words have been used for it, so on and so forth. So that is a fact that that human beings have recognized that deep down something inside uh, there is an, an evil force that can emerge from within or an, in, an evil force of suggestion uh, exists uh, within human beings and this is something that is cross-cultural even cross-religion even cross-time like I said so if somebody says to me there's no such thing as jinns my answer is well okay fine I can't show you an object called a jinn like the way I can show you a pencil. But I can show you for a fact that across time, across culture, across civilizations, across religions, there is this concept of a, you know, this concept of a de demonic force that exists. So from an anthropological point of view, it's, it's actually very, uh, very normal, very, very factual. Very, as a matter of fact. Now, Carl Jung, <clears throat> you can say in some ways, tried to combine psychology with sociology and anthropology in, in, in some ways. Anyway, that's a longer discussion. Um, now, as far as the, what do they do? So when Shaitan, now l l let me share with you something interesting. Um, I, I mean, because I have a lot to say on this issue, so I don't know, you can stop me anytime you want, really. Um, now, in the modern times, when people say, what do you say to somebody who says, I saw a UFO? What do you say to somebody who says, a UFO abducted me? What do you say to somebody who says, I felt the Holy Ghost inside me? I'm sure you heard of this, right? Yeah. The Holy Ghost talks to me. I remember I was debating against a pastor who was actually a missionary. And after, you know, all the arguments were done, he said, well, okay, fine. You might be logically correct. I have the Holy Ghost who talks to me, mm -hmm. right? I have the Holy Ghost that talks to me. So there are people and more and more people in the world who are having what we call in psychology auditory hallucination. They have audit they're hearing things and they know that they're hearing things. And so uh, not everyone is schizophrenic that hears every or a multiple personality that hears things. There's a lot. I mean, I have a YouTube video on um, the cure to hearing voices and, 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 you know, you just read the comments there. And I'm basically in that video very simply saying, hey, if you hear things, re you know, listen to the Quran. It's for the non-Muslims. And the idea is that if you listen to Quran, you'll see. I mean, I had, I wish um, one of the brothers was here. I have a video uh, out there. It's called Jin Tristing. I was invited by the MSA. I took one brother with me. This is, uh, this is you know, a, 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 so there's a person, he walks from New York and he's hearing voices. And he's basically voices telling him to come to this place and uh, to where to, you know, to our masjid over here. And he's like, you know, I hear these voices. And so we read Quran on him. He doesn't now. The only way I, I can show you this as a fact that somebody can be hearing voices. And if you let me read Quran on him for 10 minutes, he will stop hearing those voices. We've done these experiments over. I mean. Between me and one other brother, his name is Sheikh Shakib, between me and Sheikh Shakib. Um, we've probably done over 500, this 500 times, you know, people with schizophrenia, people with uh, multiple personality uh, or other mental in illnesses, other phobias, you know, or anyone with auditory hallucination. And you read Quran on them and they will react to that because this thing also sometimes people call it the orb. A lot of times people are taking videos and stuff. And they see these like round bubbles. And, and, and you'll see this especially in, in, in places like churches. You'll see this especially in um, when people, a lot of mass of people are just, you know, kind of like in a possessed state. This is what happens in a church. A lot of times when they're going hallelujah and they feel that, you know, the Holy Spirit's within them. It's a jinn. So I can't show you the jinn, but I can show you the effect of the jinn. I can't show you the jinn, but I can show you the effect of the Quran on, on a person who has multiple personality. Uh, 
-hmm. I can't show you the jinn, but I can show you uh, the effect in one way or the other. Okay, so and, so people who, for example, there are some Muslim speakers and scholars. For example, uh, I've seen videos of uh, Dr. Shabir Ali, uh, was from Canada. Uh, yeah. You know, very good um, debater. Yes. He, de he debated yeah, a lot. Marvelous person, yes. Yeah. He is very skeptical on the issue of jinn possession, possessing humans. So how would you argue here about things that we believe in that we don't see and to someone else they might seem irrational? So for example, jinn possession. So how would you like take that argument and say, well, you know, maybe that's irrational. Maybe someone will say, well, jinn possession is irrational. So how do you balance that when we do have this issue of, you know, some hadith that are not like obviously in, in this sense that seems a bit Yes, well of course I would go further and not only with this hadith, I would say that the whole idea that jinns possess people is in fact irrational. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it seems contrary to the Islamic ethos as well. Um, in Islam we understand that the person is responsible for his or her actions, but once you say that the jinn possesses a person or that there is this possibility, mm -hmm. uh, someone can always claim that, you know, the thing I did yesterday, that was under jinn possession. And if That's we ask, true. well, where is the jinn now? The person can say, well, the jinn was only possessing me yesterday, but he's gone today. And who knows, maybe he'll possess me tomorrow again. Uh, so it, it does not seem to fit the Islamic ethos to say that jinns actually uh, possess people. And from a rational point of view, uh, one scholar who has done the most extensive studies uh, on this that I know of, he concluded that uh, the, the uh, symptoms of jinn possession, what is called jinn possession in the tradition, are the same symptoms of uh, psychiatric disorder. So that if a person is betraying such symptoms, the best way to treat the person is through m modern medicine. And only if that fails, he says, then we might resort to the mm -hmm. idea that this is a case of gin possession. But I would say keep trying the medicines because maybe there's something that has been overlooked and uh, we need to keep working at that. And some, some Muslim uh, scholars have uh, taken gin possession, demon possession, They've, they've seen this as something being borrowed from Christian culture, from the Bible, for example. Um, what is your view in regards to this? Um, is it something that's possible? Uh, have you seen any actual possessions where you think this has to be a jinn in a person? Or do you think it might be something that's been borrowed from Christian culture? I think there are aspects of it that might be borrowed from the Christian perspective. <clears throat> Uh, but uh, as far as uh, me, myself, yes, I mean, people, and I can, I don't know if, if you wanted, maybe I can um, even put people online who have had gin issues and, and can talk about it. And, but, you know, most people want to leave it privately, obviously. But, uh, but, the, but yeah, I mean, we know, like, okay, so there's two ways that I'm approaching this. One is from the field of psychology and trying to say that like we know these there are things that we don't know how to cure and so we turn off the brain so the was was and the reason i'm referring it to the brain is because when we turn it off when we turn off the brain then that was was the auditory hallucination goes away now what is very interesting you'll find is that these auditory hallucinations they're never positive for the most part like, I'm talking about a person who has schizophrenia. I'm not talking about the person who says, hallelujah, I have a Holy Ghost in me. I'm talking about multiple personalities, schizophrenia. You'll be very, it's very interesting to know. Most of these times, most of the times, like, you know, um, let's say somebody stopped taking their medication. Now he's hearing hallucinate. He's hearing these uh, voices. And most of the time, these, these voices are going to be negative. And they're going to be putting the person down or they're going to telling him to do suicide. And the thing is, is that why, why these negative voices? You know, it, 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 like Allah subhanahu wa in, in Surah Al-Baqarah specifically says about shaitan, يَعْمُرُكُمْ بِالسُوءِ He will command you to do evil. وَالْفَحْشَاءِ And to do fahsha. وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ And to say things about Allah that are not true, that you don't know about. And that this is like a common fact. People have a grandiose feeling about themselves or they feel that they know God or they feel that, you know, it's it's very like there is definitely 
a pattern that is common. And, and the thing is, is that if it's just mental illness, why does it manifest itself the same way all the time? Um, as far as uh, gin possession in person, now not in, t in the field of psychology, but I can give you one example. Um, <clears throat> there was a father in, I believe in New York. Um, he had his son, he was in a mental hospital. He believed that he had gin possession. So he wanted me to go to the mental hospital and read Quran over him to tell him, is it medical or is it gin possession? That he's acting in weird ways. Uh, so I went to the mental hospital. Oh, you know what? Uh, my business partner is a good example. He will tell, like, my business partner, um, let me call him quickly if you don't mind. Uh, his, his name is Justin. Um, but Justin is a good example. Uh, Justin, you know, I was a Muslim. He was not a Muslim, Justin. And uh, we have a, a business we do together. And so, uh, Justin, uh, because I was, uh, hey, so, like, so I'll have Justin call me back. I just called him. He didn't pick up. Let me just text him. Um, so anyway, uh, so when Justin called, but the, the example of Justin is, uh, Justin is another person who had to go to the mental hospital for a little while. And I was telling him because I told him that, look, your girlfriend seems a little off. He wasn't Muslim at that time, but I told him, you know, your girlfriend seems a little off. She seems to have these jinn issues. So one day something happened and he said, oh, well, why don't you read your Quran on her since you think. Anyway, that jinn, I was in a different state. He was in a different state. The jinn went from her to him. He ended up in the mental hospital himself as a result. But then, you know, uh, I told him, I went to him and I gave him the cure. I said, you need to do this, this, this. And he did it, and alhamdulillah, he came out very quickly. Um, but, you know, th in this example where I was saying the father, he went to the mental hospital, and I was reading Quran on this kid. And you, I mean, subhanAllah, you believe it or not, like, as I was reading Quran on this kid, the, the man that was on the side, like this other patient that was on the side, started to talk to me, saying, you need to stop reading that. Like, you know, that's hurting me. What you're reading is hurting me like that. So, you know, and, and, and then it then it became common knowledge for me that uh, if you when you read Quran, it begins to affect them like and begins to hurt them if they're not good. And so there have been many, many, many personal experiences like that a lot. Like, I, I mean, just I can spend a whole day or two just talking about them. Yeah, there was a child that came to the Prophet uh, that was brought by the father to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And, uh, and, uh, and it was understood that he has possession of the jinn. You could tell this by the wordings of the Prophet. The Prophet hits him in his back and he's, he's, the Prophet says, Come out, the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We know the Prophet had, done, magic was done on the Prophet. You can't do magic without dealing with the world of the jinns. The difference between the jinn, just a jinn issue and a magic issue is this. First of all, let me differentiate between jinn and shaitan. So jinn is a species. Amongst that species, those that take a promise, a, 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 a wa'ad, you can say, or, or, or half, they take a promise that I will, I will make human beings my enemies. Those then belong to the, to the, you could say, the tribe of the shaitan or tribe of iblis. So there's, there are jinns who, in order to get power, in order to get credits, you can say, or to get uh, some some special status, they will join the gr this group of Iblis and they will make human, they will take the promise of we, we will work against human beings. So those are their shayateen, okay? Now shayateen can be a, a human being or jinn, but I'm specifically referring to how a jinn becomes a shaitan, okay? Number one. Number two, that the difference between just a jinn possession and magic is that if there is a, let's say, a jinn and he sees a beautiful girl without hijab after maghrib, let's say, so now this jinn may start begin to uh, bother this person in different ways, which I'll, I'll, I can give you details of how that will may work if we have time. But um, now, 
the difference between, so that's just a jinn. So I'll read Quran, the jinn gets hurt, the jinn dies, or the jinn leaves. That's it. Magic is when a human being and a jinn get involved together. So a magician in the human world who has contact with certain jinns, they may be magician jinns, and those jinns control other jinns, and then they use that, uh, that, that they have a contract together. Meaning the human jinn and the uh, the human magician and the jinn, the ma the magician jinn, you can say, or the jinn that is working with the human being, uh, they have a contract. When they work based upon this contract, this is sahar, this is magic. And they may try to hurt someone or affect a marriage and so on and so forth. This is why when magic is mentioned, what's mentioned in Quran in the very famous ayah? And they followed what the shaitan, meaning the jinns, uh, revealed to them regarding Suleiman. Regarding the kingship of Suleiman. Suleiman didn't do kufr. But it is the shaitan who did kufr. Mm -hmm. And they would teach people sahab. They would teach people how to do magic. Let me also, you know, this whole issue of Harut and Marut, also let me clear this based upon the very good explanation given by Imam Sayyuti and Jalalain. And that is, look, people were claiming to be prophets, especially in Bani Israel. Many people would claim to be prophets. How do you know he's a prophet or he's a jinn? I mean, how do you know he's a prophet that an angel is coming to him and not a jinn is coming to him? Because somebody can say something miraculous who is a prophet or somebody can say or even do something that has a jinn with him. So how do you differentiate? So these angels came to teach that knowledge. But knowing that knowledge also opened the doors to the knowledge of magic. So this was actually the issue. They taught people sahar. They taught people magic. What the jinns taught is magic that you have a relationship with me and we'll do this for you now for the normal people and and when allah subhanahu wa sent harut and marut to teach people how to differentiate if this is magic meaning this is shaitan doing this or a prophet uh, then they said, look, we're going to teach you this art, how you can tell this, but it'll, it's going to be a test because this will give you access to those jinns also. It, meaning you'll be able to tell if it's an angel or if it's a jinn. And if you have bad intentions, you'll start talking to those jinns and trying to use them and for your, your purpose. Especially the story of Suleiman and how... Uh, people were learning this magic at the time and falsely attributing this magic to Prophet Solomon. And this leads to where we are today, where there still is that party of the Jews, not all Jews, but a party of the Jews which delve into this magic and still hold on to this magic and maybe perform these rituals to this day. I believe so. Yeah, and, and see, what's very interesting is is for a person who denies jinns and the work of jinns. So I would because your question was about possession. My my point, my first point is is that there possess, we know from the Quran and Sunnah magic exists, and the, there's only a very slight distinction between possession and magic. Because when there's magic, there has to be possession too. The jinn has to go inside the body to do whatever he's hurting the body or trying to cause a certain feeling so on and so forth but that can happen without magic meaning the jinn can take initiative himself or because of a contract that is uh, that is done between a certain human and in the jinn world um so that was in terms of what does quran say about this i mean i i love uh Mona shabir ali and uh, he's very smart and uh, sometimes smart people have the I you know they 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 have the excuse you can give them for uh, making small mistakes because they're they're looking at things from a a new perspective or perspective of knowledge. Um, 
But my experience is, like I said, uh, the same as majority of the uh, scholars, which is that there, there's something called jinn possession. But regarding the question of how do I know that there's jinns, it would also be interesting to keep in mind you have people that do that claim to have access to i mean there's a whole industry you know there's a whole industry of kabbalah uh, that helps businesses get more customers you can look this up online like how to do kabbalah to get more customers or how to do kabbalah for your businesses and how like kabbalah is jewish magic basically and so how do you use magic to 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 you know to help yourself is something that it, people make a lot of money with and then and, and, and this whole billion dollar industry of astrology or where they're doing uh, card, uh, tarot card readings and the person's like, yeah, you're right. You know, this is why it's uh, so seductive, because some things that they say are right and 99 percent of the things that they say may not be so right. But um, they, it, it's seductive because, you know, the, the gin, the gin world says things and, 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 and people go back and go back and go back and then the person's like yeah i'm talking to the dead spirit of such and such person which again is just the jinn either the jinn of that person that just died or just a jinn pretending to uh, be that person mm -hmm. and how much um, are you familiar with um certain sufi traditions who have uh, intermingled aspects of kabbalah into the religion of islam with numerology and certain tawees which they have. How, yes, how this has become um, very problematic. Very mm -hmm. problematic. And this is derived from Kabbalah? This is derived from Kabbalah and uh, from the Hindu arts and, uh, you know, from, from uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, it definitely these things, because you know what happens is that the intention should be, I want to please Allah. But then the intention becomes, how can I show miracles? Or how can I show that I'm, I'm super close to Allah in some materialistic way? And this is where shaitan gets you. You think you're having some sheikh is coming to you in a dream or something else is happening. And the goal in the end is to do something against sharia. If I was, if I would have been an, an atheist after, because the only logical thing for me after Islam was atheism. And, you know, I always used to say to myself when I was in, uh, in Egypt, uh, I always used to say to myself, you know, if I only can see a jinn or, you know, or something like that. You know, that would like seal the deal. Like I would be like, you know, so actually it, it doesn't happen to me that way. If you do meet jinns or have you know, jinns around you, uh, it doesn't really increase your faith that much, honestly. Um, it, it wasn't what I was thinking, right? It just becomes a matter of, I mean, think about these magicians. Don't they see the shayateen around them? Don't they see the unseen? But it doesn't, it doesn't, knowing, seeing miracles. I mean, all these people that saw the miracles of the prophets, it didn't change them. Right? You see the miracle of Musa, and then you're questioning Musa. Mm -hmm. So miracles itself is not the only answer sometimes. So in, in that sense, uh, you know, um, I would say that, uh, yes, I've seen a lot of uh, things regarding the jinn world and, 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 you know, a lot of miraculous things. And, uh, and that's just how it is. I mean, I have, but I can't prove it to anybody, if you know, necessarily, except for the eyewitnesses that may have been there at a certain point in given time. One thing uh, I've, uh, I've learned over the years, children are more susceptible to witness and see supernatural things, the unseen. Before puberty, kids are uh, seen as pure. And when I was around uh, around nine, ten years old, I fell asleep. Uh, I believe is around two, three a.m. And I saw a figure just standing next to where I was sleeping, maybe around three meters away. Mm. And it was against the fridge, 
uh, it was a figure with his arms and his with his hands and his hips standing almost like a god hmm. and he was translucent so I could see through him but he was like a light and the more the figure went down as soon as he got to his knees start disappearing so I couldn't see his feet at all but it was a standing figure so what what do you think this could be uh me being you no know, there's uh, a psychologist uh let me actually uh, bring up the book over here I'll tell you. it's called born that's the, i believe that's the name of the book and and i'll tell you something very interesting about what you're saying and what muslim scholars have always been saying born because i, I believed uh at the time when i told everyone that because i was young they don't want to scare me they said oh you 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 must have dreamt it or something but um when i witnessed this i tried going back to sleep i couldn't sleep because my heart my heart was pounding so mm. i was too scared to move but when i eventually found the courage after around 15 20 minutes i just ran upstairs and just slept <laughs> just slept in, in my parents room okay mm. now I'll sh- share with you something interesting on this subject this is a psychologist his name is his name happens also to be justin barnett the b- book's name is born believers the science of children's religious belief and basically the the thesis of the book is that children believe in the unseen naturally this is why they will say oh there's a monster here. or just even very simple example uh active imagination just that they imagine friends right it, they are in tune with unseen the children are born believing the idea of the unseen it's the idea of the unseen is uh kind of like innate just like language is innate uh we don't know how we learn language when we're children the same way children believe in the, if you tell any child about some fairy or some santa claus or some any anything to do with the unseen world they will believe in it immediately it's innate in us to want to believe in the unseen it's only later after being in the material world after some time that we forget about that part of ourselves or we just begin to we lose that fitra the mm-hmm. the natural part of ourselves to want so, to believe in the unseen so so me seeing this basically it it was a figure that I couldn't see the features on his face I couldn't see any detail it was a figure standing there like a light but I couldn't see his feet his feet vanished uh there was no feet but it, it was a figure standing there as as almost a god and for many years i thought this must have been a jinn uh yeah most people likely, in my family they were saying oh look it can't be a jinn there was a quran right next to uh, next to where you were sleeping it wasn't a jinn but for many many years later when when uh, you know i read certain things and it just occurred to me because when you when you read ayatul kursi before you go to sleep they said an angel guards you till the morning till yes. fajr yes so is it a possibility it could have been an angel uh, it is, is could it be sorry sorry you broke it up it is there. possible it it is possible it could be an angel it's mm-hmm. not impossible if if you like i said this book uh documents and 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 um i have heard hundreds of stories about mm-hmm. people in their childhood experiencing one thing or the other. Jinns are also less scared. They're less scared when you're sleeping, a. They're also less scared when you're smaller. They're not as scared. The jinn, the jinn world I'm talking, the average jinn is not as scared of a child. And mm-hmm. and they you know, they'll even become ch- friends with the children um like in their imagination world. And uh they're not they don't feel as threatened by uh, by children compared to adults especially um male adults they feel a little bit more threatened can you give like a last few words on the people who who become uh, al- almost obsessive with a lot of uh, negativity or become obsessive with uh, certain topics uh they they get really uh attached to like a uh, jinn and uh, dark and demonic things um for example uh being more hopeful for people being more hopeful uh any few words you can give just for people to be more balanced 
the best best balance comes number one in terms of adhkar is number one to focus on the quran what is the message of quran the message of quran puts everything in balance you know it emphasizes what needs to be emphasized and doesn't emphasize those things but mentions the things that are important everything in quran is important but it, it re-emphasizes because dhikr means to remind so when quran is read as dhikr because Quran can be read as dhikr, it can be read as a book of tadabbur, which means to dive deeply into it and see, get its gems and jewels. So, you know, the sur- on this, like the Quran can be thought of as an ocean, right? So there's a surface. And the surface, you can even get the surface message of Quran even from a translation. So there's the sur- and then you can dive deep into it. For that, you have to know, air, you know, more Arabic, you know, the better. And, and the other sciences with that. But the point I'm making is that you need we need to focus on the basics and the basics of the basics is to have a relationship with the book of allah because that will really put a balance into your thinking it will give you a deeper thinking but it also put a balance into your thinking make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas أشهد أن لا إله إلا